Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy. This is Long Long Honeymoon, where we talk about the fun stuff in life, like violent crime. This week's topic, courtesy of viewer Mixter, who asks, what about the fear of being a victim of crime or being hassled by weirdos? We've actually been asked about this a lot over the years. So in this video, we're going to give you five proven strategies to safeguard against violent crime when you're traveling with your RV. Strategy number one, secure campsite selection. Choose campsites wisely. Obviously, where you decide to camp has a lot to do with your odds of being a victim of violent crime. I have this shocking theory that there are some parts of our country that are a little bit more dangerous than others. You know, I think camping in downtown Philadelphia is probably a little more dangerous than Amish country, based upon my personal <laughs> well, experience. But we've done both. We have done both. <laughs> we have done both and survived. We have camped in a variety of scenarios in North America. We have camped on the side of the highway, especially like in the Yukon Territory and in Alaska. We have stopped in rest areas. We have stopped at truck stops out of necessity at times, although that is not our first choice. We've stayed at many Walmart parking lots. We've stayed in many campgrounds. Even campgrounds have different levels of security. Mm -hmm. Some campgrounds have gated campground access. Mm -hmm. So if you are really wanting tight security, I think if you are in a secure campground environment, you will have very few worries with regard to random violent crime. So quite often before you choose a campsite, you can do online research at sites like campendium.com and you can learn about the campsite and or campground. Frankly, sometimes there's a thin line between an RV park and a trailer park, but you can discover that beforehand online. Do some research and people will let you know typically if the campground happens to be located in a bad part of town. And over the years, I can think of a couple of scenarios when we have stayed in places that were in kind of a sketchy area, shall we say. And nevertheless, in most cases, we had no problems whatsoever. Now, Christy and I have done a lot of so-called overnight parking over the years in various parking lots. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, not all parking lots are the same. Once again, downtown Chicago might be a little more dangerous than rural Iowa. What about boondocking, you may ask? We do love boondocking, and we do love that feeling of being out far away from everyone else. Some of you might not feel comfortable with that feeling because I do think if you are camping far away from everyone else and you have no other RV travelers within your eyesight or vision, then you are probably at higher risk of maybe being randomly accosted. I'll put it this way. If you are out in the middle of nature, far away from cities and other people, your likelihood of encountering a criminal is much lower. However, there's no one around you to help. Okay. I think also something to think about in those situations is what is your cell service like? Like if you're somewhere where you have zero cell service and you can't call for help, I personally do not feel comfortable boondocking in situations like that if we are the only people there. If there are other campers around and it seems like a very family friendly or, you know, camper friendly environment, then it doesn't bother me so much. But if we're somewhere where we're the only campers and there's no way to make a phone call for 911 or something like like that, then I'm usually not comfortable with that. Well, then you need to be at high alert. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. And more on that in a moment. But, you know, there are other times where you can boondock out in the middle of nature and you can be on Bureau of Land Management land and you may have other RV travelers in your vicinity but you don't have to be right next to them. Right. And I can think of, for example, near Goblin Valley State Park in Utah. Outside Goblin Valley, there are many just wide open spaces that make for some beautiful boondocking areas. And I remember doing that and having other RV travelers who were, you know, a third of a mile, a half a mile away. Yeah. And everybody in the RV community anyway tends to keep an eye on one another. I think close enough to where if you screamed or yelled or, you know, drew attention to yourself, 
honking your horn or something, other people would come outside and be like, what's going on? And even in places like Walmart parking lots, you can choose particular places within the parking lot to park that might be safer than other places. We typically like to park in a well-lit area of the parking lot. Yes. And if you look at uh, Walmarts, for example, they have security cameras really plastered all over the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And some parking lots these days have actual police tower cameras too, where the local police force will set up a monitoring station in the parking lot. And some Walmarts even have security roaming the parking lot at night. So you might encounter that as well. And by the way, if we are ever separated in a Walmart or shopping mall type of overnight parking situation, let's say Christy goes inside the store and does a little shopping while I remain inside the RV. When she is walking across the parking lot, she will give me a call and I will monitor her progress either into the store or back out to the RV. Because when you think about it, in these situations, you're probably most at risk when you are outside your RV and outside the actual shopping facility when you're actually out there walking around in the parking lot. So if you are traveling with a partner, it's a good idea for one partner to keep an eye on the other whenever that other partner's walking across the parking lot. So strategy number two is to maintain a low profile. So this means don't get out all your flashy equipment when you're somewhere where you don't feel like it may be the safest environment. You want to make sure that your bikes are locked down, kayaks are locked down. Don't leave that $300 Yeti cooler just sitting out willy-nilly. Things like that that will attract people to steal them if they see that it's an easy target. You know, try to keep all that stuff locked in and... <laughs> Out of sight. If you're swimming in shark-infested waters, don't slather your body with blood. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. It might attract the wrong kind of attention. Yeah, and we have personal experience with this situation. We were camping on the Las Vegas Strip, and uh, it used to be the KOA. I don't know if it's a KOA anymore that's behind Circus Circus. And uh, it's basically a glorified parking lot um, with hookups. And we were staying there thinking, oh, we're in a KOA campground. What? worries should we have? Well, there's a lot of um, vagrants that walk through that campground at all hours of day and night. Roughly an hour ago, Sean and I returned to our camper from a lovely evening out in Las Vegas. We had gone to grab a bite to eat and just kind of stroll around and look in some of the casinos. And um, we came driving up to our campsite here at the Las Vegas KOA, only to discover that my bike had been stolen. Apparently some blankety blank 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 <laughs> decided that my bike looked like fun which it is but they decided to take it for themselves and didn't even leave any money behind for me so anyhow I'm left without a bicycle for the rest of our trip which is pretty sad it's just an odd feeling especially because I felt like we were at a KOA I felt safe now I don't feel safe anymore I feel like there are people lurking right outside of our little door that want to do bad things, that want to cause harm. And that, to me, is the most disturbing thing about it. That is the one incidence of theft in all of our years of RV travel we've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And once again, choice of campsite. Yes. It was actually not a secure campsite. It was adjacent to the Las Vegas Strip. No gates of any sort. You know, just anybody could walk in or drive through for the most part. So... Not a great camping situation. I don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mean, starting to suspect there is crime in Las Vegas. <laughs> well, and I think it's in certain parts of town, for sure, because there are other parts of Las Vegas that are super nice and very upscale. But if you're not from somewhere, sometimes it's not super obvious that an area is a high crime area, especially if it's a place that's just been revamped. It can look nice, but you know, looks can sometimes be deceiving. Maintaining a low profile is just a good idea when you're in public. You just don't want to put any temptation out there. And yeah. this is primarily focused on theft, but I suppose if you interrupt a thief, the situation could escalate into mm -hmm. something more violent. Strategy number three is critically important, 
and that is to practice situational awareness. Be aware of your surroundings because dangerous people could be anywhere. We spend a lot of time in life worried about grizzly bears and great white sharks, but human beings are really the most dangerous animals on the planet, and they can be mean. <laughs> so pay attention to your surroundings. You know, I can think of one situation that we had in a Walmart parking lot, surprise, surprise, and this one was in Colorado, mm -hmm. and there was a person in the parking lot who was very mentally unstable, clearly mentally unstable. Having some sort of breakdown. Having some sort of breakdown and just seemed to be capable of any kind of erratic behavior. Mm -hmm. And like, it was actually a woman. She was yelling out, like, really erratic hand gestures, kind of just very bizarre behavior. And I think those of you who are living in our great cities in this country probably see mentally unstable behavior on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For us, this was a little bit unusual. Yeah. Uh, but it seemed like a situation that could potentially escalate. Mm -hmm. So I think the best course of action would be to notify any management. I mean, if, if there is management of a particular property where this situation is transpiring. Secondly, it's probably to move. Yeah, Your RV has we wheels. <laughs> yeah, we packed up and drove away and found a different place to overnight park. If, if you feel uncomfortable about a particular situation and you have an RV, use the wheels in your RV to move to a better situation. And Absolutely. that's what we did. And at the time, I was a little bit tired. It was late at night. I wasn't too thrilled about driving 30 or 45 minutes to the next spot down the road. But that was the best choice at the time. Move to a different situation. You could be possibly in an RV park and maybe you pick up on some kind of domestic dispute. I mean, in, in fact, I think what was going on in Colorado was probably some sort of domestic dispute that was spiraling out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, just be aware of your situation, especially out west. This is an unpopular truth. There's a lot of homelessness. And you will see quite often vagrants milling about in parking lots. People that are obviously on drugs, you know, they're just sort of spaced out. And you just never know what somebody's going to do when they're in that mental state. So keeping your distance and removing yourself from their vicinity is in your best interest, I think. So again, that kind of goes back to strategy number one of secure campsite selection. You may choose a secure campsite and then the situation around you changes. Mm -hmm and you notice that the situation is no longer safe, then you move on somewhere else yeah. before the situation gets worse. That's the peaceful way out anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Avoiding violent conflict is smart behavior. If we look at nature, consider grizzly bears. Even with all of their natural weapons, their fearsome claws, their fangs, their tremendous strength, as a general rule, they avoid violent conflict because intuitively they know that once violent behavior begins, you can never truly predict how it's going to end. I'm talking about overnight parking because I think you are more likely to encounter some sort of criminal when you're out in some random parking lot than you are when you're inside a campground. In fact, I would say that campgrounds typically are among the safest places in our country. It is very, very rare for there to be some sort of violent crime in a campground. In fact, I would say it's almost unheard of. Situational awareness applies, of course, to refueling your RV rig as well. Occasionally, you're going to have to stop at gas stations or diesel stations and refuel and obviously anytime you step outside your parked vehicle you are exposed and you are at risk of being approached by the bad guys so practice situational awareness here if you pull into a fuel station and you have a bad feeling about that fuel station move on this is why it's a good idea to always top off your fuel in your RV rig from time to time, even if you're not 
in desperate need of fuel because you can stop, you can stretch your legs, and you can safely refuel, and you don't find yourself in a desperate situation where you must stop and use that particular gas station. That was not a scream. It was an 80s song. If you have a bad feeling about a gas station, just move on. There will be another one down the highway. Strategy number four is to utilize an RV security system of some sort, whether it's actually like an alarm on your RV that's going to go off or if you have external cameras so that you can see what's going on outside of your RV. We actually started implementing that, I guess, last year. And it made a big difference because if you're somewhere where you you can't easily see right outside your RV and you want to have eyes where you're not like peeking out the window yourself, you know, you can <laughs> take a look at that little video screen and see exactly who is around your RV and what's been going on. And you can leave it to record when you're not at your RV. So that's very helpful because you can see if somebody's been like sneaking around looking in your bed of your pickup or under your RV or trying to look in the windows. So when we talk about RV security systems, we're talking about both monitoring the area. That'd be the first type of security system. And we have a couple of different camera systems. This was one by RealLink that can actually be powered with solar power mm -hmm. if you prefer. And now that we travel with a Starlink internet system, we always have a connection to our campsite. So we can always monitor what's happening at our campsite, even if we are not at the campsite. And if there's motion at our campsite, if we're boondocking, for example, mm -hmm. we will receive a notification on our phone and we will see if a deer or a raccoon or a criminal is prowling around our campsite, even if we're not there. And if we are there inside the RV, once again, we can pull up our phone, use the external camera system to monitor the perimeter. Now, the second type of RV defense system we're talking about would be a self-defense system like this. <laughs> and yes, uh, <laughs> Rambo approves. Let's hope that it never comes to that. And I know that many of you out there throughout this entire video have been thinking about firearms. And I'll talk a little bit about firearms here. I mean, obviously, you have a Second Amendment right to carry a firearm. Do I think that you need a firearm to go camping in places like national parks, state parks, Really, most places in the country, I don't think you necessarily need a firearm. Not for protection from bears. We hear that a lot. Yeah. People are like, oh, there's a bear. I'll have a gun. No. Yeah, but we're talking <laughs> about violent crime here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have no problem with it. And in fact, I think it's probably a good thing to have a firearm. I will say this. If you carry a firearm, you need to know how to use it. And if you go for the firearm, and this goes to our next strategy. You need to have a plan for what happens if you utilize that firearm. You know, there have been some situations over the years. It is incredibly rare that this would happen, but I can think of more than a decade ago, there was an older couple yes. who went on an RV trip and they randomly happened to cross paths with a couple of escaped convicts who had mm -hmm. escaped from prison. And the couple who were RV travelers, carried with them a firearm. The escaped criminals ended up taking that firearm and using it against the couple. So it was really a worst case scenario. So step five is to develop an emergency plan. So this is what he's talking about. Like if you're going to do A, then you need to know what step B is going to be. I think it's important to think through different scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, wherever you may find yourself stopped overnight, if you are in an overnight parking parking lot, you need to apprise your situation, uh, look at your surroundings, and decide what happens if you do have to pull out some sort of means of self-defense. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of alternatives other than firearms. Yeah. I mean, for example, pepper spray, which would be my choice. Pepper yeah. spray is very effective. Yeah. And I can tell you from the times we played around with bear spray, it is shockingly powerful and I think would neutralize any attacker. If yeah. you spray them with pepper spray, they're going to be out of commission for a while. And even using your bear spray on a person, because bear spray can yes. can shoot really far. Shoots like 20 or 30 feet, whereas pepper spray, you know, the person has to be fairly close to you for you to 
you know, discharge that and, and get in their face. Bear spray is incredible, yeah. but you get one shot. Yes. Exactly. You have one shot that lasts, I believe, 20 seconds-ish. Mm -hmm. So when you fire that bear spray, you better hit your target. Right. And uh, that goes really for any of these means of self-defense. Now, I will show you another highly sophisticated weapon. <laughs> <laughs> the old lead pipe. Yeah. Or in this case, steel pipe. But, you know, having a few things like this uh, lying around, like behind the couch or in your truck, mm -hmm. uh, is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but again, if you break these things out, you need to be prepared to use them or certainly make sure that they are not taken from you and used against you. Yeah. I think incapacitating the attacker and getting away is your best strategy. So I think that is the pepper spray situation or even bear spray, what have you. Yeah, step um, one, camp away from these types of people to begin with. Step two, be aware of your situation in case it might change. Three, if you do use means of self-defense, use them. And, and I will tell anyone watching this video, if you see me brandishing a firearm in self-defense, it's going to be fired. <laughs> I'm not getting it out to have any more discussion with you. Right. And I, I think mean, that's frankly, usually yeah. what, what police will tell you. You yeah. know, when you pull out a gun, you're, you're, you are scared for your life, right? It's not just to scare the person off. You are scared for your life and you're ready to shoot it, right? So that's why I think you need to be really careful about when you choose to pull out that gun because it, you're automatically escalating the situation when you pull out that gun. And if you've watched the news in the last couple of years, you've seen many instances where someone has thought someone was breaking in their house or someone turned in their driveway or knocked on their door and they immediately leapt to firing their weapon. And it turned out that this person was not there to attack them, was not there to threaten them in any way. And then the person that shot that gun end up ends up going to jail. It's pretty hardcore and serious if you're going to pull out your gun. Yeah, now people are going to be afraid to knock on our door because they think I'm <laughs> some kind of nut. No. In fact, for many, many years, we traveled with no firearm, yeah. frankly, and I felt comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. We have been to more than 40 different countries around the world, and we don't carry firearms internationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel very confident in general traveling without firearms. However, these days in the United States, I can certainly understand traveling with one with an RV. I have my own personal grenade launcher. Uh, you need to be very certain that the farm is, is secure mm -hmm. uh, because firearms are lethal weapons and children don't always realize that. You know, we were once camping in Yellowstone National Park and a family had brought a pistol into the park stored in an ice cooler to protect themselves against grizzly bears. And what do you think happened? A young girl found the pistol and accidentally shot herself and died there in the park, which mm -hmm. was a pretty sad day in Yellowstone. I was standing outside in our campsite at the time. I heard the gunshot and the screaming. Yeah. So if you choose to carry a firearm, then make sure that it is very secure and you know how to use it and you, you treat it with proper respect. Wow, this took a dark turn. It is. It's kind of a dark topic. <laughs> it you is. Know? And, you know, we have never been in a situation where we have felt like we need to get our gun ever. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's extremely rare. I think if you're doing steps one through four, step five, where you're like going to have that emergency plan where you're considering bringing out a weapon to defend yourself, you know, that is worst case scenario. Right. That's like know? going nuclear. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So we don't want to scare people by talking about that. But, and, you know, steps one through four are very important to keep you from having to go to step five. You right. Know? I want to make very clear, I'm not encouraging anyone, A, to own or carry a gun, B, certainly to use a gun. That is your personal choice. I'm simply saying that if I go to a firearm in a self-defense situation, the time for discussion is probably over for me because I'm, I'm getting the firearm to use it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you have been warned, world. <laughs> 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 but I really don't think it is generally necessary. 
I don't think you have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I respect anyone who wants to take advantage of their Second Amendment right to carry a firearm. And I equally respect those who are comfortable traveling without one. Because we've been on both sides. We've been we've on both, both sides. And carrying a firearm carries with it certain risks. There are a lot of downside risks to just having a weapon or lying around. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you always want to keep it in a secure place mm -hmm. where other people cannot access it. You know, especially children. So you want to practice the best practices of safety with regards to the firearm. And, of course, check the states that you'll be visiting because different states have different laws regarding traveling with a firearm. So there's a lot of preparation that goes in, into that. I mean, the firearm is the last resort, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. But if I go to the last resort, I'm using the last resort. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we never, ever find ourselves in that sort of situation. And I really don't think that we will. I mean, the best way to deal with trouble is to avoid trouble to begin yes. with. Yes. And we can tell you with great confidence because we have at this point camped in 49 states. We've been all over North America. We have never once felt the need to pull out any kind of firearm. Yeah. We've, we've felt the felt need to move on threat. before. Yeah. We've been in that situation a few times where we've looked around and said, mm, you know what? This isn't a great situation to be in. Let's move on. I think that's the most important thing is to be aware of your surroundings. I think women are usually better about this than men because, you know, women tend to be victims of violent crime more so than men in a lot of cases. And so women from a young age are taught to be aware of your surroundings when you're walking to your car and, you know, always look over your shoulder and, you know, that sort of thing. So ladies, teach your guys, you know, some of the <laughs> things that we've been taught for a long time. I think there's a lot of fear about this particular topic because mm -hmm. no one wants to be the victim of a violent crime, and you hear about them every day in the news. I've tried looking at different statistics because I wanted to quote some statistics for you about <laughs> this. I think I saw one stat that said there are around 16.5 violent crimes for every 1,000 people age 12 and older. But as Mark Twain said... There are lies, damn lies, and statistics. So, like, who knows the, the real number, but it's definitely a very, very, very small percentage of people who are victims of violent crimes. Yeah. And I think by taking these five strategies into account, you really can avoid most violent crime. Mm -hmm. You're not going to experience it in general in, in any kind of like park setting, any kind of campground setting. Yeah, national park setting, state park setting, extremely, extremely rare. And the, the few times you do hear about violent crimes in those situations, it's usually people that know each other. It's not just a random stranger attacking someone. Right, some sort of domestic dispute mm -hmm. or drug deal gone wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we need to end on a high note. Yeah. So, all right, guys, next week, nuclear war. <laughs> More fun on Long Long Honeymoon. I think this was an important topic because it's on a lot of people's minds and we get a lot of questions about it. Yes. But should you really worry about it? I mean, I'm going to say no. You should not spend a minute worrying about it. You should know these five strategies. Prepare. Prepare. Be aware and know that, you know, <laughs> most likely you will never, ever be put in a situation where you have to even think about this sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, in all the years we've been doing this, we hear from thousands and thousands of people that are RVing across the country. We have never been contacted by somebody who says that they've been attacked or robbed or anything like that. Now, have people had things stolen from a campsite? Yes, we have heard about that. But even that is fairly rare, you know? So on the whole, the odds are in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the Hunger Games out there. May the odds ever be in your favor. But especially in campgrounds, I don't think you have really any worry there. Most people in campground situations are RVers just like you. They're wanting to spend time with their family. They're wanting to spend time in nature. And in fact, they are probably going to be looking out for you. And if you need help, 
you know, they will help you. So it's those off situations where you're off camping alone, you're in a parking lot, you're in a truck stop, you're in a rest stop, you're camping in a city situation, maybe you're parking overnight on a city street, something like that. Those are really the situations where I think you need to be on high alert. And oddly enough, we've done all of them and have had no issues whatsoever. Yeah. Knock on wood. Yeah, knock Sorry, on. guys. Thus wraps up a bizarre episode of Long Long Honeymoon where we talk about the fun stuff in life. So if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you've been in a situation where you have felt unsafe while you're RV camping, comment below and let us know like what kind of situation you were in, what you did about it. Did you call the police? Did you call the park ranger? You know, did you just move on to a different location? We'd be curious to hear from you guys if you have those experiences. If you haven't yet, please click that little subscribe button down below. And if you click the bell icon, you'll get notified every time we post a fresh Loloho video. Yeah, guys, post a comment. I'd be really curious with our audience. Have you ever been unsafe? Have any of you, heaven forbid, been a victim of a violent crime while RV traveling? Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of anyone who's Like personally. This? Yeah, personally. Because uh, I don't really know anyone who's had any kind of issues like this, but I'm mm -hmm. sure it probably has happened from time to time. Post a comment. We look forward to reading your comments. Yes. And until next time, what do we say? Lo -lo. Lo -lo. This video was brought to you by Arch Oil. For many years, I've been using Arch Oil AR9100 friction modifier in every oil change in our good old diesel truck Seymour. These days, Seymour is also getting a healthy dose of AR6500 diesel treatment. You know, the quality of current diesel fuel has been compared to canine urine. And AR6500 really improves the quality of fuel going into your diesel truck. So if you want to extend the longevity and improve the performance of your truck, use Arch Oil products. For more information on Arch Oil, look for the links beneath this video.